Welcome to Open Minds, a Freedom of Thought podcast series, interviewing the people who bring courage and independent thought to the challenges of today. Well, hello, Matt Storla. Welcome to the Freedom of Thought podcast and video guest. Hey, thanks for having me. So I want to start with a little bit about who you are and uh, how you came to do the things you do. So you grew up in Miami, went to Harvard and were a history major. And you've had a career since then as a public intellectual who has occasionally worked in public service. So you started out as a blogger for the Open Left blog. Your work then was associated with anti-Iraq war blogging and with net neutrality issues. Subsequently, you worked in the House and Senate, uh, always for Democrats on issues of financial policy around the time of the 2008 market crash. Yeah, you're welcome. We fixed it all. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for no, fixing our just, economic system. Yeah, no, no. Everyone out there, just you're welcome. And what have you been doing <laughs> in the meantime? <laughs> you wrote an important book, Goliath, The Hundred Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. You've written a variety of articles in leading places like The Atlantic and The New York Times. And now you're the director of research at the American Economic Liberties Project. Your calling card, as I see it, is a kind of populist democracy. Populists can lead to misunderstandings, but I, what I mean is you have a majoritarian conception of how power should work in a democratic country. Uh, you think that in broad strokes, the, uh, the economic and other policies in a democratic country should reflect the convictions and interests of a majority of the citizens and couple that conviction with a, a descriptive sense that it's not happening, it's not working that way because of some sort of excess of elite control. Um, so some call that populist democracy, but because it can lead to uh, misunderstandings, I have another term for it, popularist democracy. Um, and your focus is on the economic sphere. You're carrying forward an old tradition in American political thought, the tradition of economic populism. So I'm gonna start here. Uh, I'm always interested in the connection between a person's life and thought. What formative experiences led you to your outlook? What, what made you you with respect to your focus on economics and government? I mean, I think that's a, those are a, a lot of, that's a kind intro. And, you know, I've always been interested in, in two things, really business, uh, commerce and, and politics. When I was eight, I dressed up as, you know, a lot of kids want to be firemen or whatever for, whatever for Halloween. And I, I put on a little, um, I tried to dress as an investment banker <laughs> with, a, with like a, a little briefcase. I didn't Did know what I- Did you send that to Harvard when you applied? Uh, I, <laughs> I didn't. I think they kind of, they probably knew that or something. No. And, um, but I always, I, I was just really interested in business and, uh, and also- uh, Oddly enough, comedy writing. I really loved comedy writing. Um, and I think that that was those two things, really seeing the kind of the absurdity of life and also the guts of, of commerce, right? And, and how people trade with one another as a foundational element of human society. And, uh, and then the absurdity of power, because that to me is what comedy writing really was, was about. And when I, um, when I graduated from... Harvard and I did my history. I looked at the history of Keynesian thought and and uh, as an undergrad, and I don't think that to, you know I, I'm not totally sure. When I went, when I was going to, when I was learning history at Harvard, they weren't teaching about about economic power. It was a very neoliberal framework. It was you know these things happen? There are these inevitable large trends. Not people made policy decisions. So it was very confusing to be. Uh, an undergraduate learning that kind of weird, a historical view of history from histor ostensibly historians, and um, when I um, when I graduated, it was into the dot com boom, right, right, with with a lot of what was political rhetoric about democracy and about empowering people, but through the through private industry, through these dot coms, through this kind of like set of technological innovations, but also get rich quick schemes. And it was it was just totally fascinating to be in that in that moment, and then to watch it all collapse. And then I um, I think I I learned my politics through the watching and participating in debates over the war in Iraq and over the financial crisis because I was a somebody who believed in elites, 
you know, I, the world had worked for me and, um, you know, grew up like somewhat wealthy and then, you know, went to elite school, had a lot of choices about what I wanted to do. And I thought, oh, this is, this is pretty fair. And then, uh, I, I did a lot of research on whether the war in Iraq was a good idea or not and went to lots of panels and, you know, talked to a bunch of different kind of elites and read various books by people at Brookings and John Kerry and because I'm a Democrat, right? And I, I decided, well, the war in Iraq is a good idea because all these people I respect at the New York Times and Tom Friedman think it's a good idea. And then it turns out it was a, it was a totally immoral disaster. And I personally somehow endorsed what was in effect mass murder. And I wanted to figure out like that, that made me really depressed for a few years. And I needed to figure out what happened to allow myself to convince myself to endorse this deeply immoral act. And I got into politics and blogging. And um, what was surprising to me after seeing the war in Iraq start and realizing, oh, this is a total disaster almost immediately, was that the people who had pushed the war got promoted. And the people who said this was a bad idea, by and large, were not. And I, that was totally shocking to me because I had believed a lot of the elite rhetoric about meritocracy and the, the men in suits being like, we have to do this. And then it turns out it was a disaster. And those men in suits got more power. And that was crazy to me and really shook me because I had, as like, as an aspiring elite, I had validated myself with all of these, you know, all of these cultural signals saying you are a smart, important person to be. That is why you are in these important areas. And that is why you deserve this. And that is why you have to sacrifice or, you know, that sort of self-pity that elites are constantly told. And then it turns out it was all nonsense. And it was all nonsense to justify this deeply immoral act, which I myself had endorsed. And I, it was something I can't, you can't forget. You can't go back. You can't unendorse that. And so, you know, a couple years later, and I, I, I became much more radicalized and said, okay, the, I didn't, I was like, the Bush is a huge problem and the, the Democratic leaders are a huge problem and the media is a huge problem. And I was trying to sort of look for something. I was like, this is, this. I got to find something. Um, and it was, it was sort of a journey to figure out what is, what are, what are my politics? And I went, you know, I was on the, I had moved from sort of centrist to being on the left. And uh, then the, the financial collapse happened in 2008. And I was, at that point I had, was blogging. I had done a bunch of, of consulting and, and I worked on net neutrality, which was my first anti-monopoly um, experience. And it, when the financial sector started collapsing, I didn't know that much about finance. But this this sort of similar group, the men in suits came and said to the various rooms that I was in, because they were doing it in all over, but I was in a room at the AFL-CIO with a bunch of like liberal groups. And they they were saying we have to we have to give George Bush a trillion dollars to bail out the financial system with no strings attached. And I was sitting in that room full of people who had been complaining about George Bush for years. And most of them were scared and they were like, we have to do this. And I, I was like, I have seen this movie before. I remember in 2002 when they, the men in suits said this about Iraq and they were lying then. And I bet they're lying now. And I don't know the details, but I'm guessing it's not true what they're saying. And that, you know, and the rest of the people that I was with were too scared to oppose the Geithners and the, you know, the Bernankes and the, the, the people who were in charge. Um, and so they put forward the bailouts and I, I realized, okay, I have to learn how governing works. And so I started to work in Congress for a member on the Financial Services Committee and got very involved in financial policy around questions of too big to fail banks. And, you know, my general thinking was the Democrats are the party of the people. Uh, or at least historically they have been. But somehow under the Obama administration and Democratic controlled Congress, we saw a crisis caused by the concentration of wealth and power, too big to fail banks. And our response was to further concentrate wealth and power through mostly a series of bailouts and then kind of a mostly irrelevant ornamental bow called the Dodd-Frank um, which is similar in some ways to the ACA. It's about consolidating power and then putting a regulatory overlay on top of it. And, and I knew that the people around me weren't corrupt. It wasn't a problem. The traditional left-wing explanation for why we did this was, oh, 
campaign finance, corruption, whatever. And But I knew a lot of the people who had done this and I was like, they're not corrupt. They're not taking money to do this. They legitimately think that you need to consolidate wealth and power to build a good society, right? That's the right solution. And they're wrong about that, but they, they didn't want to for foster a foreclosure crisis, but they felt they had to. And so I wanted to understand why that was. And that's what led me to write my book, Goliath, and to, to get into antitrust, which is about consolidations of power. So one of the things that's interesting about this for me um, is the, I guess you could say, bipartisan nature of your uh, sense of objection and alienation. And and the, so, so at several points there, you identified yourself as sort of a man of the left or- right. uh, uh, a sort of moderate, you even said, became radicalized to the left. Yeah. But it's not quite the standard story of left versus right or Democrat versus Republican. Because you were as disappointed in the Democrats with respect to the Iraq war as the Republicans and with respect to the financial bailout uh, as you were with the Republicans, or nearly so. So one of the things I've loved about you, and we've had several discussions before today, is your openness uh, to people on... Uh, both sides of the left-right divide. Uh, this Freedom of Thought podcast is associated with the Federalist Society. Right. Uh, and that's a part of a conservative libertarian legal movement. I'm associated with that movement. But when we talk, I don't, it's not just that I don't sense hostility. I actually feel um, a great deal of common cause. And it's, it's interesting. It seems to me that it's partly about a true belief in the civil exchange of ideas, but it goes beyond that. Uh, you're also thinking about politics in a way that bends categories. You have some ideas in common with people on the right and some ways in which you think the left is really going wrong or parts of the left are going wrong, or at least parts of the Democratic Party are going wrong. So could you explicate that a little bit? I mean, why, why did your pathway through political thought lead you to a set of ideas that bend left, right, Republican, Democrat divisions and categories. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna sound a little bit weird, but I think comedy has a lot to do with it. <laughs> and the reason is because you can't really fake funny. And you can fake most things, but you can't fake funny. If you're not, I mean, there's an expression, the only true meritocracy in Hollywood is, is comedy, right? And, um, uh, you know, there's, there's just, you know, you. you if you're the son or daughter of a powerful director or person like that, you can usually you get your way into the industry, but you can't get on stage and make people laugh. If just because you're come yeah. from a powerful family, you have a, a particular credential. And I think that speaks to like your basic sense. So you're a teacher, right? And what we, I think, share is a view that people are just people, right? And I'm like, I think if my, my politics, you could describe it as sort of a frustrated elite. Um, and and I believe in, in elites. I think elites are just fundamental to human society. I don't think that, I think there are lots of different types of elites, but political elites are real and they always exist. Uh, and I just happen to think that this elite world has done a particularly bad job in understanding that they are just people who happen to be in a position where they have more uh, expertise and, and, uh, and authority just because that they're just in that position but have misused it. If you, you know, one of the things that you're taught as an elite is that you are better than other people, right? And you know more and you deserve the power and authority that you have and you owe very little back. It's just a dessert. dessert. And I don't believe that. I think that, um, that people are just people. That you could pick another, you know, you could take a, a random segment of people Re, you know, sort of retrain them, run a simulation of today, put them in the same, you know, upbringings, and you'd find a roughly similar situation that we have today. People are just people. And what I think where, and, and our habits and political views are learned and can be unlearned. And I think that's a pretty profound, it's not a radical notion, but it's a pretty profound notion. And I think it's the underpinning of the American experiment. It's also something that's not, uh, that is uh, deeply threatening to our institutional fabric today. Because our inst most of our elite institutions, I think, are designed around excluding people. Like our universities, 
most of our top universities are luxury brands at this point. It did, you know, it, if, to get into Harvard in the 1950s, it was fairly easy, right? Not that many people applied, but if you applied, you had a pretty good shot at getting in. Today, it's incredibly difficult to get in. It's roughly the same size um, university, even though America is a much bigger country. And so, you know, what are we doing there? I mean, Harvard is a luxury brand. A lot of these universities are luxury brands. And people are, are and, and I, I really just fundamentally don't like that way of thinking about the world where you're credentialing people and just saying they are better than other, you know, some groups of people are better than others. And I think what I fell into the monopoly space because the the historical tradition, the dormant piece that was missing, why we screwed up the financial crisis, and it was a democratic screw up, but the Republicans, it's not like they were any different. They wanted to do the, roughly the same thing. Um, they just did, happened to, to only be in power up until 2008. Um, the, the, the basic view of both sides, the elites during that period was, we are better than other people, our experts. And it was couched in this technocratic expertise piece. And it was, our experts, our economists know how the world works. And the people who are getting foreclosed on, the people who are you know flipping houses or, or doing uh, whatever they were, they were doing, um, they should have no role in designing policy. And ultimately, to get out of this crisis, you need the CEO of Goldman Sachs to tell you what to do, because that guy, you know, who knows more about banking than the most successful banker, right? And that was like, broadly speaking, what the Obama administration thought, if there was a way of thinking, who knows more about geopolitics than the top generals, who knows more about whatever, whatever policy area other than the top people in that, in that area. And the fundamental anti-monopoly tradition was always, and you can go back to Jefferson, you can go back to the 1600s, and you can uh, you can go back to uh, Brandeis or wh whoever you want, Frederick Douglass. And what you'll find is that they'll say it's not the currently successful status quo elites who create, who make something new. It's the unknown person, mm -hmm. right? If you move the encumbrances out of the way, they are the ones who create, and that is a function of of liberty and making sure that you don't have this encrusted elite on top yeah. of everyone. Could I could I interject there? So when I think about your your uh, bipartisan doesn't seem like quite the right word for it, but your nonpartisan spirit, uh, this way in which you can be both a man of the left and not hostile to people on the right, and not necessarily enamored with others on the left nor hostile to Republicans, nor enamored of Democrats while still being a Democrat. This, this sort of set of particular attitudes that you bring to the table that, I'm, that I find so um, moving in, our, in a time that is so tribally polarized that it feels like uh, politics reaches into the fabric of our souls. Uh, I, 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 here's how I would restate your commitments. Tell me if this sounds right to you. You've been disappointed by both sides. You've been equally disappointed by both sides. And your analysis of the disappointment is that both sides have a group of elites. They present themselves as neutral experts. They're actually interested operators who are wrong a lot and have a common premise. And the common premise, whatever their individual differences or their party differences, their common premise is that they're better than other people and should be making the decisions. And so something about your uh, sense that the problem is a corrupt elite and the solution is popular power, as it were, alienates you, productively alienates you from both political sides. Have I got that right? Uh, I'm not sure that that's 100% right. I am somebody who, I, I don't like the general narrative of declinism that I think a, a lot of elites have. I would say both sides have both disappointed me and surprised me in positive ways. So let me give you an example. And but I think we don't tell the story that way. We've we've you know the traditional. I think um, when you go back to the 19th century or 20, you know early 20th century, there's this notion of uh, the American system of government and uh, the American system as this. Uh, this mechanism where, which we can use as people to ensure our liberty. And we have to fight for it, but it was a very optimistic view. And I think that that's, uh, 
really the counterculture in the 60s and 70s turned that on its head and said, in fact, America is an oppressive force. Um, and it comes back to this a basic view of, of humanity. Uh, I believe people are just people. And there's a sense of, well, people are wicked, in, innately wicked, or people are innately good, which I, I think are neither neither are true. But there's this there's this narrative of declinism that I think people the there's a, a pot that that comes from the counterculture vision of of um, um, the, the people as a as a um, as a wicked or as a um, as an inherently good force. Um, Operation Warp Speed. Let's take that right. Unbelievable. Within Could eleven, you find it real uh, quick for uh, our uh, listeners. Operation, yes. So Operation Warp Speed was the plan successfully executed to develop a vaccine for COVID uh, and deploy it. And so we had this disease in November of, um, or maybe it was January of of twenty twenty. We had the the um, genetic um, code for COVID published on the internet by Chinese scientists. And within three days, we had uh, a vaccine developed on on a computer. And then it got tested and put out within 11 months. And it was on trucks going to, to places to put you know needles into arms. And it wasn't perfect. And there were you know huge problems. But whatever you think about the vaccines. It was a remarkable scientific and political achievement. And, you know, you didn't see anybody complaining, oh my gosh, undocumented immigrants are coming and taking our vaccines or whatever, because it was free to everyone, right? And that was under Trump. Trump said, we're going to make sure that everybody gets these these vaccines and it's not going to be a pain in the ass. You go to CVS or your local drugstore or the tents set up by government and you can get your vaccine. And it was... You know, if you're on a left winger, you would say, well, that's that's better than single payer, right? Nobody has to pay for it except through their taxes. And it's not a pain in the ass. And also it de- got developed um, and it was done through competitive means. Trump handed out, I think, nine contracts to different pharmaceutical companies. So they had to compete. And I guess three or four of the vaccines were viable. What a remarkable story. What a remarkable achievement. But of course, the left didn't want to say, look at what Trump achieved with this single payer type of scientific and political achievement. And I think the right didn't want to make that point for similar reasons, for for different reasons, but like there was a similar desire to deny that narrative. So of course, probably the most remarkable scientific and political achievement of maybe the last 30 or 40 years by government and private industry, we just sort of ignore that it happened. Right. And I'm not disappointed with our elites. Like, that's actually an incredible achievement. So but like, why don't we tell the story that way? So that's kind of like one one point. And then the anti-monopoly policy. I mean, I do a lot of work with within Demo- within both parties and we've got incredible policymakers. So Lena Khan at the Federal Trade Commission, who is just really a, in, a great thinker around anti-monopoly policy and big tech. Jonathan Cantor at the antitrust division. And that's under Biden. But under under Trump, you know, there was. It was much more chaotic and incoherent, but he did bring the first monopolization case in 20 years. It was a monopolization case against Google. He brought one against Facebook through the Federal Trade Commission. I am not disappointed with what like that's that's incredibly successful for for both parties. So I think that both parties are moving in a really positive direction. But I think maybe to get back to your point, I don't necessarily feel comfortable with you know, situating myself anywhere on the political spectrum, say, because of I think the culture war is stupid and generally annoying and meant to distract us from what is really happening, which is a concentration of power upstream that's fostering a lot of social discord. And I I don't mean to say it's like completely dumb, but because there are there are obviously like points of disagreement that people have and that's completely legitimate. But what is a lot of the rhetoric and frustration is just about the consequences of uh, of consolidated power down. You know, the people feel it downstream, but they're not they're not seeing the upstream element of it. But the elites, I think, the we've moved in a really healthy direction since the Obama, the Bush and Obama administrations in a lot of ways. Um, and I can talk about not. You know, one of the things I've done. And I just want to flag this because it, you know, I, 
I, I wrote a lot about um, monopolies and private equity harming our national security defense industrial base. And the Pentagon has moved a lot on this as well. So there's, there's, there is like, there's a broad societal sort of waking up to the con- consolidations of power that I think are really dangerous and a threat to our way of life. Um, so in that sense, I'm really optimistic. I just don't think I feel comfortable. Like there's not like a political movement that one could sort of say, I'm part of this or that. Um, whereas you can easily say I'm a man of the right or I'm a man of the left or, you know, whatever, you know, there's, there's not a term for it. And I use populist and you said, well, because that's controversial, let's call it popularist. But like that, that's, I think where the discomfort is coming from. That's also a great transition to talking about antitrust and antitrust right. fundamentals. So let's make that transition now. Um, transition. Transition. <laughs> Segway. Everyone, we're segwaying. <laughs> uh, so let's move to let's move to antitrust fundamentals. Okay. So you fundamentally write about power, economic power, political power, cultural power, how economic power becomes political and cultural power. But your lens, first and foremost, is antitrust. And the antitrust is an area of law and economics concerned with market competition and monopolies. And as I prepped for this interview, I thought to myself, how did I understand antitrust law before I went to law school? So the true answer is I can't remember, but I think there's a fair chance I had no idea what antitrust was about or only the vaguest notion of what it was about. So let's start at the basics. I want to get into history in a minute. But just initially, could you define antitrust? Like, what is that area of policy and law and economics? And what does it have to do, briefly, with contemporary problems? Yeah, so antitrust is a body of law that is designed to address market power in our economy. It's it's the, the there are a lot of other areas of law regulatory policy and whatnot, but antitrust is a specific one that's that was designed to focus on industrial corporations in the late 20th century and then sorry, late uh, 19th century and then moving forward on a bunch of new antitrust laws were passed um, up until basically the 1970s to update it and make sure that there weren't concentrations of power in our economy, a kind of a constraints on big business, essentially. And then in the 1970s, there was a flip where we had thought about antitrust as a mechanism to preserve liberty by decentralizing power, in many ways like a Madisonian view of um, you know, different parts of government checking each other. This was moving, the antitrust was a way of, of addressing uh, the consolidation of power in the private sphere and bringing that divided government element there. By so in brief, what we're talking about here is an area of law about big business. Yeah. And especially monopoly business. Right. So like if there's, you know, if there's one car producer, just Ford. Right. And everyone has to buy a Ford. Ford can presumably price those cars really high or make the cars really unsafe and people just have to live with yeah, they, it. Yeah, they can set the terms and conditions for the auto market. They become the government of that market, right? And so the idea with uh, antitrust law was to prevent that sort of accumulation of private power in one place. Right. To prevent private governments in our commercial sector. So it's a field with a history. And you already started to allude to this with the sort of switch in the 70s and how antitrust works. It's changed profoundly over the course of its uh, life as as a legal field. In the early days, it was associated with economic populism. There was sort of the Teddy Roosevelt trust busting ideal. When I learned it in law school, I learned it as a technical field of economic analysis and legal precedence. Um, And it was, it was. It's a science, right? It's a science. And it was taught as a sort of movement from darkness to light, right? right? It was the bad old days of trust busting and hostility to big business. And then the enlightenment era of consumer welfare and so on. So I was wondering, can you just take us on a walk through that history and help us understand the different stages, starting with like the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act, and just walking through the stages? Yeah, so. America in the 19th century was sort of this place of one of the trends was economic equality. Obviously, that wasn't all of it, right? There was slavery, and, uh, but but economic equality was basically the, the bedrock of the American order. And then in the 1880s, uh, 1870s, 1880s, you saw you know railroads facilitate the creation of the of the multi-state corporation, the national corporation, and this was a real shock to our 
political order, what do we do about this concentration of power that we hadn't expected? And one of the responses was the Sherman Antitrust Act, which said trusts, which was basically a national corporation, it was called a trust at the time, um, are unlawful, and especially if they engage in, in monopolization or restraints of trade. And that was basically targeted at Standard Oil. And, you know, there were a lot of debates about what to do, about the over, you know, the, how can the federal government um, weigh in on state issues and so on and so forth. But basically, from the 1890s until the 1930s, there were a series of fights to figure out a way to make industrial power consistent with liberal democracy. And then after World War II, you know, they strengthened antitrust laws because there was a vision, there was a view among political elites that Nazi Germany was a result of the concentration of economic power, IG Farben, monopolies like that. And fascist Germany was a monopoly state. And so Mm -hmm. 1950, there was a strengthening of antitrust law specifically because they said consolidations of economic power facilitate fascism and authoritarianism. And that kind of held until the 1970s. And there was this, this, you know, the you're a big business. You, you're you always looking over your shoulder, making sure you're treating suppliers reasonably well. You're treating rivals reasonably well. You're not engaged in unfair or coercive behavior. Starting in the 1970s, there was a pushback on this that came from the left and the right, but largely the technical tools were developed by Robert Bork. And in many ways, the Federalist Society was an outgrowth of this. Um, to say actually all of that, as, you know, traditional anti-monopolism and antitrust was economically illiterate. Like big business isn't big because it's powerful, right? Which was the traditional view. We need to rein back power because they're engaged in coercive behavior. Um, big business is big because it's good. Like, you know, f- you can see this today. Google isn't isn't uh, big because it's powerful, it's big because it just has the best search engine, right? And Facebook, so on and so forth. Therefore, any attempt to constrain big business will just harm economic efficiency. So what we should really be doing is looking not at liberty or rivalry or power, but efficiency and place the hand, place uh, antitrust in the hands of economists, this enlightenment, this period of light, the consu- what was called the consumer welfare standard, which is really about saying we need to focus on efficiency. And for a variety of reasons, socialists on the left and then the uh, libertarians on the right agreed on this. They embedded this in the law in the late 70s and early 80s. And that is the paradigm that we're in today. Yeah, when I learned econo- uh, antitrust, economics and, and law, all the discussion was about consumer welfare. Right. Uh, economies of scale, right. natural monopolies, and concern with just the power, potentially the cultural or political power of big business, were sidelined uh, or backgrounded. They were not the center of the field. And I sometimes read with uh, kind of perplexity uh, the rhetoric of sort of small business ownership uh, from yesteryear, from the Brandeis era, the Roosevelt era. Can you can you help us see what the law looks like in these two eras? Maybe give a, an example of a case from the early era of antitrust, an example of a case from the contemporary era, era of antitrust, and um, help us see how the different perspectives affect outcomes? Yeah, so okay. Um, so there was a case against, um, I think it was Xerox, that uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different cases that you could you could pick. Um, so there was a there was a series of cases in the 50s and 60s and 70s that had to do with dominant firms using their patents to maintain and exploit market power. And so there's one particular case about Kodak. Uh, I think it was Xerox. And Xerox was forced to divest its patents and just license them on a non-discriminate, not divest, but license them on a, a non-discriminatory terms. And there was a, an FTC official, I believe, in 2001. So this case was in the 70s. And this guy uh, was a Democrat named Tom, I believe it was Tom Willard, but it was his first name was Tom. And he said, um, you know, I looked at this case and it was very strange because it seemed like a discovery from an ancient civilization. But it also seems like the remedy might have done some good. 
And that was really perplexing and disturbing, right? Because because there was this whole amnesia that set in in the 1980s, this idea that, that, that the old stuff was just terrible. And you want to know, like, the that came... So one of the cases that that came from was a 1956 consent decree with AT&T, which said AT&T has been engaged in all sorts of, of coercive behavior because it, it was a monopoly. Uh, one of the things AT&T has to do is it has to license its patents on a non-discriminatory basis. And so this was true for IBM and RCA and a whole bunch of other companies. Well, one of the things that AT&T licensed was something called the electronic transistor. And well, as you know, a, a company, a small company called Motorola, another company called Texas Instruments licensed it. And lo and behold, there you have semiconductors, um, Fairchild Semiconductor. And so Silicon Valley is a function of antitrust activity in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, we unlocked the knowledge that was in big business for the to the American public. And that has really flipped. So now you have, it's really hard to to innovate in, in, um, because of, of sort of patent control. It's a completely different philosophy today. Although if you're in China, you can just steal USIP and then innovate on top of it. Effectively, China is operating in a 1950s US paradigm, innovating on American technology that America has locked itself out of. So a, a, a different case would be the, uh, the Trinco, which I believe was ruling, it was unanimous decision in 2004 or five, where Verizon was um, uh, effectively controlling a, a, you know, it owned a, a its own telecom network and was excluding rivals from that network and got sued over it. And the uh, court said, the Supreme Court said that, yeah, sure, they're, they're going for a monopoly, but that's a good thing. The incentive for a monopoly is what makes private, uh, what makes capitalism work. And that the antitrust laws are not designed to stop monopolization. They are designed to foster economic efficiency and growth. And Trinco really like, you know, it really circumscribed, it really limited section two of the Sherman Act because it said, yeah, you can go for monopolization. I mean, it like really just flipped it on its head. And after Trinco, what you saw was tremendous consolidation in all sorts of markets. It was kind of like the last antitrust, major antitrust case before today's ferment was the Microsoft case in the late 90s. And then that, that Microsoft lost that case. It was about to be split up. The uh, Court of Appeals flipped that remedy. And then when Trinco happened, everyone in the software industry said, man, we got to just roll everything up. And that's when companies just started to roll up. And that's when I think Oracle bought sales, um, was it Salesforce? And anyway, there was just like a whole series of roll-ups. Um, it was a very different, you know, what you saw from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, where we just looked at big business and said, what they are doing is important and can be useful, but we also need to make sure that they're not engaged in coercive behavior and not limiting rivals in innovation and liberty to the 2000s when when the courts were saying and enforcers were saying the circums limiting people from being able to use essentially their public rights of way is the essence of capitalism and antitrust. It's a completely different uh, vision of what, a, not just an economy, but what a society looks like. Let's get into that a little bit. What a society looks like. Um, there's a rhetoric in the early era of antitrust when it was about power, not efficiency. Let's divide the eras up that way. There's an era where it's about power and an era where it's about efficiency. Uh, in the era when it was about power, there was a lot of concern about the small business person. Right. Uh, that person's independence and capacity to earn a living. Uh, small and, dealers and worthy men, small, from a quote from an 1897 Supreme Court case. Small dealers and worthy men. And yeah. as I understand it, Bork in his famous book, The Antitrust Paradox, developing the efficiency view, said that quote, that line, is one of the worst things in the history of antitrust law. Small yeah, dealers he, and worthy men. It was, it was a, I think it was Bork or Havenkamp, but it was the same sort of school of thinking. They hate that line because it undercuts the whole, you know, one of the things Bork did and, and Breyer was part of this and Havenkamp was really a bipartisan thing was this rewriting the history of antitrust to say antitrust in fact in the 1890s was never about power it was never about it was never a question of political economy it was just a question of economics and in fact 
all that mattered to the people that passed the Sherman Act was whether things were efficient. And the small dealers and worthy men line, which was uh, Rufus Peckham, Justice Rufus Peckham wrote that and said, it doesn't matter if prices go up or down. It doesn't matter if things are efficient or not. The point of the law is to protect the rights of small dealers and worthy men. Undercuts that whole narrative that they wrote about the purpose of the antitrust laws. And so they hate that line. Um, it's just because it just it just shows that their whole way of thinking, uh, a lot of the case law that's developed since the 1970s is based on a faulty premise. So how do you think about that line? Because I take it you have the opposite view. You think that small dealers and worthy men line is onto something. It reminds me uh, when I was an undergraduate, I studied ancient Greek history, and um, my teacher repeated uh, argument from Victor Davis Hanson uh, about the, the origins of Athenian democracy. And the argument was that a new kind of person developed in Athens at the time because of its military situation, economic situations, farming, and so on, it was the farmer citizen soldier. It was a person who was independent with respect to their ability to provide for themselves. That's the farmer part. A person who's equal with respect to citizenship and a person who has arms, who can defend themselves. And they became sorts of independent sources of political power that had to be integrated into a democratic state. That democracy was really the effect of the emergence of this new kind of person who is not a slave or a servant or an aristocrat, but just an independent person. As I understand it, you have a similar understanding of what that um, or, uh, that ideal of small dealers and worthy men is about. Can you explicate that? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but I believe in Athens, the, you know, essentially next to the forum where there was democratic debate was the market, the marketplace. So, and I think what you've seen traditionally is marketplaces are play, are areas where people come together under a socially regulated framework to exchange um, with one another, right? And that, that is a fundamental aspect of how humans live. It's also the a fundam how we structure that marketplace is a fundamental aspect of political power, and it always has been. And so when I look at, at the question of, of small dealers and worthy men or, or monopoly power, you know, there's what I'm what I think of is this isn't a, there is no way to think about this in the context of efficiency. This is purely a political decision because markets are public institutions. Someone is writing the rules. Someone is always writing the rules of a market. So there's this this notion that was developed in the 1960s and 70s, this idea of deregulation, which doesn't make sense. Not a coherent idea because the idea of getting rid of rules isn't isn't a thing. When you remove public rule setting, you just facilitate private rule setting. So Mark Zuckerberg writes the rules for social media or Apple writes the rules for app stores. It's not like we've deregulated those areas. We've just said it's not going to be public rule setting. It's going to be uh, rule setting through private governments. So we the, the problem with the Bork mindset of we just have to think about efficiency and there is we have to get rid of politics and antitrust is there is no getting rid of politics in antitrust. There's no getting rid of politics. We have to make a society. That is what politics is. It is fundamental to the human experience. So when I'm thinking about market power or markets, I'm thinking about what is the right way to build a society where we protect liberty. And we have to think about economics in that context. And we have to think about the right way to do things efficiently in that context. But we also have to think about what kind of society do we want, right? That's the first question. What kind of society do we want? And the antitrust laws were written, you know, sometimes there's all these phrases like the Charter of Economic Liberty, the Magna Carta of, of um a free enterprise, you know, all of these, and they are political statements. They are, we want a society where people have the liberty to pursue their trade. And that is how I think of it. I think that's how the framers of these different laws thought of it. It is, I think, how the current enforcement regime 
is thinking about it. It is not how the judiciary is thinking about it. But there's a, you know, there's a huge debate now since the financial crisis, since too big to fail banks crashed the economy, where it shows that the efficiency model is silly. Like it wasn't efficient to have massive banks that crash the economy. So all of their like, oh, we need economists to make sure that things are efficient. It's total garbage, right? We don't have an efficient economy to try buying insulin. <laughs> like um, it's massively costly. Like, but. More, but the fundamental problem is we stopped thinking about the premise of these laws being one of liberty to protect the citizen and started to think about it only in terms of technocrats, technocratic elite fostering efficiency to benefit the consumer. Those are very different political frames. And the antitrust laws were clearly written for the first one, but they have been inverted to, to for the second. Your, your remarks about uh, the freedom to pursue a trade are interesting uh, in light of the experience of lawyers over the past uh, half century, let's say, 50 years, uh, really since the 70s. Right. What we've seen is tremendous. I mean, this is an industry I happen to know. As I understand it, uh, what I'm about to say is true in many professions and many industries. It used to be that there were a whole lot of lawyers in solo practice and a whole lot of lawyers in small firms, essentially them and a couple of partners, a couple of friends. Uh, and in those settings, they made handsome but not huge incomes. Um, I cannot speak to whether they did better work for their clients. Uh, but they had a great deal of independence. They were essentially self-employed, right? Uh, and they could um, structure their practices as they liked. And there were a lot of diversity between different kinds of practices, different approaches to the law. What we've seen is massive consolidation in the law market. It's tracked by statistics. We, so we know this to be true. There's far fewer solo practitioners and far fewer practitioners in small firms. There's been consolidation around the biggest and wealthiest firms. That's made them far bigger and far wealthier than they were before. And a lot of individual people who 50 years ago would have been in uh, solo practice or small practice are now employed as uh, partners or associates in the big firms of, of our era, the, the Scadden Arps, the Sullivan and Cromwells, the Debevoise and Plimptons and others. They make seven-figure salaries um, and every once in a while eight-figure salaries. Uh, so they're very, very wealthy. Um, again, I can't speak to whether they're doing better legal work or this is in some sense abstractly better for the legal economy, but it has changed the character of work in the legal profession. You're a different sort of person. You're a member of a pr large, prestigious company, essentially, um, which is nominally a partnership and functionally a, uh, uh, a, a large corporation. Um, whereas in yesteryear, you were a tradesman plying your trade, when you, where your trade happens to be the work of law. Now, as I understand it, I could repeat that story in medicine where there used to be lots of doctors who are working in solo practice or in small groups and now are to a greater and greater extent employed by hospitals, which might produce certain effects of economy of scale, but also means they're subject to a hospital level regulation. They've essentially gone from independent tradesmen to employees. Uh, and I, I believe it is repeated in other industries as well. What do you think are the political... Um, um, well, I want to hear the best case for this from an economic standpoint. Why, why might a, a Robert Bork or Herbert Hovenkamp or others say this is good for the economy and this is as it should be? And why might you say this is bad for politics? Yeah, so Brandeis in a 1933 dissent, um, the Liggett dissent, wrote about how it was writing about the chain, the anti-chain store movement, which was about the chain stores were consolidating power in the 20s and 30s, and then they got pushed back. And then in the 1970s, uh, the laws that had passed in the 30s to restrain them, we essentially with, repealed them. And then you saw the explosive growth of institutions like Walmart, which similar similar deal, right? You would used to be you'd have the local butcher, baker, and they were an owner operator. And now it's like, okay, you have a bunch of Walmarts and you don't have a local um, owner operator, you have a, a manager. Who's you know who reports to Bentonville, um, and that's so yes the the big law, Madison it's all it, it consolidation is a I think is a um, that is the the trend since the nineteen late nineteen seventies. 
So the argument for it would be one of efficiency. And you could you could just say, well, look, go to a Walmart and you'll find all sorts of products at a, at a cheap price and it's you know nationally regulated effectively and from a, from the left wing perspective you know what they like about it is well if you want to have say more energy efficient light bulbs you just call up Walmart and you say stop stocking the old light bulbs and start stocking these new energy efficient light bulbs and then you've just replaced everything in a you know it's essentially central planning um, or hmm. a variant of central planning and that and they would maybe see that as super efficient and I think on the right they would say well this is this is for the economists say this is really efficient. Look at the low prices. And that would be, you know, that's very, that's very compelling. And I think you could, you could look at this in lots of different areas and you would say, well, you might see lower prices and, and, um, you know, and, and a, a, I think they would argue, I'm not saying I believe this, but I'm saying they would argue the lower prices, mm-hmm. better retail experience versus some dingy, you know, uh, independent store that isn't necessarily as efficient. I, I don't could think I just, that's true, but well, but, could I yeah. just interject here? Uh, I, I like what you said because it's it's not a straw man. That is a uh, serious uh, contention about human welfare and human well being. Right. That you know, allowing them to get their light bulbs or their books or right. their clothes or their food at high quality and good prices. Right. Uh, is is a net positive but, for the human experience. So but, I just want to give that but, argument its due. Larry Summers was jealous of the Canadian banking system because in the U.S. we have thousands of banks, small banks, big banks, and he in Canada they have four or five banks. And the Canadian bank regulator can make five phone calls and like change their banking system if they want to. And Larry Summers, who is a he believes in monopoly power, wishes the U.S had that system. And there's been an attempt to get rid of, we have too many banks, was the, sort of the perception. It's been the perception since the 1980s and the number of banks has shrunk. And you see that true too with defense contractors, where used we had about 100 prime defense contractors in the, in the early 90s. Today, we have five, right? The idea is, oh, just call Boeing, call Lockheed Martin, um, and you, you, can, you can get what you need. You only have to make five phone calls versus 100. Now, of course, Look at Boeing. Not doing so well, right? Not you know you you it, it's we're getting worse weapons at a at a higher cost. But that was the that's the philosophy. That's the perception. You know, consolidation leads to efficiency, right? Big business is big because it's good, not because it's powerful. Now make the argument for why it's bad for politics, bad for democratic politics. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> just look at how much effort and energy has gone into begging Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or Tim Cook to structure our political commons in a specific way, right? Which is, you know, versus asking our elected officials who we can vote for to do that, right? That is a really strange dynamic where, I mean, and so, I mean, I think just on like a political level, another example would be a couple of years ago, remember Jeff Bezos said, we're going to have an Amazon H2Q Where's our second headquarters going to be? Cities, you know, give me your give me your best offer. And like 200 cities, just the mayors just threw themselves at Amazon's feet and said, here's the subsidies we'll give you. I mean, here are the subsidies we'll give you. Oh, we'll change our name to Amazon. Like all of these, you know, this crazy begging that was happening. And it was really pathetic, the sense that we can't actually produce commercial activity through our public like channels, we have to beg an oligarch for that. And I think that is like the most fundamental, not, I see the most fundamental aspect is the terrible fear now that people have in our economy. So, so the begging, the total begging um, of these oligarchs to deliver public goods is one aspect of it. The flip side is the fear. So what you'll find in most uh, professions is whatever it is, like, App developers, like there's been this fight between Elon Musk and Apple over whether Apple's going to block Twitter from the App Store. Well, what you don't see is the hundreds and thousands of developers who have apps who are terrified of Apple and can't say anything. And there are just huge numbers of people who are terrified of Google because Google can delist them. They have way more power than the government to destroy people. Um, So if you're a locksmith, Google can just like accidentally just step on you and destroy you because you won't show up in search engines anymore and you'll go bankrupt. And this has been like a, a, and you see this over and over and over. The Congress investigated big tech firms and one of the problems they had is 
there were just a lot of companies that were like, we would love to testify, but we are afraid. And I think you see this, you know, I, I was lobbied by firms that sold to Staples and Office Depot or, or various other dominant entities. And they were like, we are afraid to speak out. So you have a whole, um, most of the business people in America are afraid to talk about what is going on in their business. It has become, this fear has become just part of the fabric of American business, fear of retaliation, fear of the monopolist. And I think that is the biggest threat to our democracy. We have become accustomed to essentially authoritarianism in the commercial realm. It bleeds into politics in a more direct way too. I mean, one of the things that I found sort of astonishing and then altogether unastonishing, altogether predictable, uh, so it was at once initially astonishing and then um, par for the course, was Twitter blocking the Hunter Biden laptop story. Right. Um, the Hunter Biden laptop story uh, had to do with this uh, uh, salacious material on Hunter Biden's laptop, but also material that was relevant to Joe Biden, re- right. relevant to uh, his financial dealings. Uh, it was on the eve of the election. And there was some possibility that the story could uh, do to Joe Biden's presidential campaign what uh, four years earlier had been done to Hillary Clinton's with the investigation into her financial dealings. And um, the New York Post published a story about the Hunter Biden laptop, and it turned out to be a well-sourced story with serious political importance. Right. But media is has also seen a sort of accumulation of power both in big tech such as twitter and in various newspapers right uh, and the newspapers treated this story as the sort of news equivalent of pornography they were just not going to treat it as something worthy right of, it was the russians uh, who planted it, it right? russian plant just ignore this this is bad right. news this is fake news um and twitter uh arranged it so that people who tried to forward the story, their tweets would just fail. They wouldn't be able to communicate about the story. Uh, So the the tweets just tanked. Um, It was pure viewpoint-based discrimination. It subsequently turned out that it was a well-founded story. And um, the New York Times printed uh, sort of an apology on page eight or page 11 or something like that, and a sort of reversal, of course, as did the other media sources, but after the election had already been decided. Turns out that kind of thing is happening all the time. I mean, Amazon will refuse to sell books. YouTube will uh, take down videos that are contrary to uh, its ideological vision under claims of terms of service. And it turns out our whole political discourse is being affected by the power of uh, media companies, especially social media companies, tech companies, with political points of view. You saw something similar with Amazon HQ2, your example, where uh, Amazon was putting political demands on various cities, and when the cities didn't conform, they lost the opportunity to get Amazon's headquarters. Uh, I want to use that reflection as a transition to, to sort of my last question on this subject, which is, how does economic power translate into other kinds of power? So how does power in a marketplace or some domain of the marketplace, like you're the most powerful oil producer, the most powerful social media company, the most powerful search engine or something like that, how does that translate into political power and cultural power? Right. Well, so so there's there's sort of two ways. So when you're a big company, you can lobby and you have your you donate to think tanks and whatnot, and that translates into influence, which is the standard way of thinking about it. And I don't, I mean, I think that that's true, but that's, that's one of the, I don't think it's that interesting because we, we've had that conversation for a long time. The other, but I think the more interesting one is that you actually become a, a key public infrastructure, right? So Mark Zuckerberg, when he was essentially downgrading the Hunter Biden laptop story, you know, he was doing it. It wasn't like he was influencing the government. He was his company had control over core public infrastructure, this communications platform. And the same is true of Twitter. Um, And, you know, when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden everybody had to like start shopping, you know, buying things online, um, companies like like, um, Uber and Amazon, the, the ones that had built that infrastructure, all of a sudden, they were governing power. 
And because we hadn't put any rules on how this public infrastructure could be used, I mean, it's like we, we've we've always had public utility rules for public utility like systems, but we didn't have that because of the law and economics movement and some left wing uh, arguments as well. All of a sudden, these companies had they were governing. And you can look at it like Lockheed Martin or Boeing. I mean, they are the way we used to control the military industrial complex is we'd say, well, if you're not going to build this, we'll go to this other contractor who will, or if you're costing too much. Well, now there's just like five companies that control everything, right? And they've, you want, you, you can't substitute one for the other. So, so the, the power we've lost huge amounts of public power through our public institutions because the consolidation has happened in the in the private sector. So one way of thinking about it from sort of a legal angle would be this. Um, if the state, uh, that is to say the federal government or any state government, uh, tried to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story because it would hurt Joe Biden's chances of getting elected, that would constitute a clear First Amendment violation. If, uh, it's viewpoint-based uh, free speech um, Discrimination, and that is a sort of light speed clear uh, uh, violation of the First Amendment if you're a state actor. Ah, but the First Amendment doesn't apply to private actors. So Twitter can spike this story, Facebook can spike this story uh, with no legal regulation at all. And effectively, our communications are being managed. Um, with the same propagandistic or manipulated effect as state action, but it's being accomplished by private action and therefore have regulated from legal control. Right. I mean, that, the, the, so basically consolidated power is upstream from censorship, right, is what we're talking about. Right. And I think there's another aspect to it, which is that because of the consolidation of advertising revenue in the hands of Google and Facebook, essentially, the number of newspapers has collapsed. And so where you might have had some dissent, I mean, you did have the New York Post reporting on that story, but you would have had a lot more newspapers that could have like looked into it or validated it or not. But essentially, you have only a few newspapers with any capacity at this point. So the consolidation in the media sector is pretty profound, as is the consolidation of communications. And so, yeah, you have consolidated power is upstream from a whole bunch of social problems that we, both people on the right and the left don't like. In this case, it's the right wing saying, we think this is censorship, we don't like it. And it is, it, it's just, essentially, it's like, the difference between editing and censorship is whether you're editing one magazine or editing every magazine, right? And this is like verging on sort of censorship. But if you had, you know, 10 Googles or, or a whole, you know, if Facebook wasn't, wasn't, didn't control three major social networks, but only controlled one, and there were there were more options. Or if you had uh, rules, uh, public rules around how to actually manage communication, so that you couldn't make these kinds of choices surreptitiously, then you wouldn't necessarily have these problems. But because of the regulatory choices and the policy choices that we've made, that says big is good, big is big is a result of efficiency, and we're going to focus on efficiency. Then you have. Um, you know, then you you facilitate these kinds of problems like censorship, like political control, like the use of public infrastructure by private actors. And I think that's a philosophical choice. There's no way to prove that censoring the Hunter Biden laptop story was inefficient. Like go to a judge and try to get an economist to say, oh, this costs, you know, every consumer X amount of, of dollars. Like you can't prove that. And you shouldn't have to. You should just we should just be able to say, we've never allowed one guy to control communication networks in America. We shouldn't, or and globally. I mean, that's crazy. Um, or two or three people. Like that's, that, that is, that should be unlawful in just intrinsically. And I think that if we had the same legal standards as we did prior to the 1980s, it would be unlawful. And because we can see that it's a clear threat to our own liberties. And I think I'll, I'll, since we're, this is a, a Federal Society podcast, I'll, I'll say that I think the, the conservatives are having a real problem here, an intellectual problem, because in order to strengthen antitrust law, which you can bring private rights of action, that's always been the kind of at the heart of it. It doesn't have to be government action. But in order to 
really builds an attack on this, what I think is an authoritarian structure, you need to empower our public institutions. And I don't think that the conservative movement, though they are uncomfortable with attacks on freedom of thought, I don't think the conservative movement has decided that they want public institutions, that they are comfortable with the government actually breaking up these concentrations of power in the private sector. And so you see, and I, I, I you know, you see this sort of like terrible fear of the Federal Trade Commission chair, Lena Khan, who should be an ally. Conservatives should look at her as an ally, but instead she's become sort of a bogeyman. And it's because this old model, this old thinking from Bork and from the law and economics movement that says that efficiency is the point of antitrust is still there. In, it's, it's still instinctual. And so you have these new problems of censorship being upstream or downstream from corporate power and people don't like it. The voters are very unhappy with it. Conservatives intuitively get it, but they haven't yet moved to the place where they can they can actually build a governing order to address it. I think that's a very nice place to end this part of our podcast together. Uh, it's to just to put a bow on it. I think you're exactly right. There is um, an increasingly widely shared recognition of the problem, which is that private power is becoming a threat to liberty. Right. And the liberty-loving conservatives and libertarians within the Federalist Society recognize the problem. The most obvious solution is to have some sort of regulatory regime uh, for private power, sort of a regulatory regime that would, for example, apply the First Amendment to a Twitter, or that would break up Twitter's power, or YouTube's power, or Facebook's power. But for deep intellectual and historical reasons, the conservative libertarian movement is uncomfortable with using government regulation to break up private sources right. of power or to regulate private sources of power. And so there's a sort of quandary and division, which also means a time of intellectual growth and excitement as people on both sides of the aisle figure out what to do about a, a if you share a familiar goal, uh, uh, the goal of maximizing human liberty, uh, what is the appropriate way to realize that goal in modern conditions? Yeah, I I agree, and I'm we could we could go on for hours, but I think it's a good time to end. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Open Minds, a Freedom of Thought podcast series interviewing the people who bring courage and independent thought to the challenges of today. To learn more, visit freedomofthought.fedsoc.org.